Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hope you're having an amazing day. I'm going to kick this video off discussing Intel's Raptor Lake, with AMD releasing Zen 4 later this year. Of course, it comes to Intel to also counter. Raptor Lake will be the successor to Older Lake, which are, of course, are Intel's 12th generation processors. And Intel have actually given us a demo of Raptor Lake and provided us some details regarding not only the specifications, but also the performance as well. And this was all during their investor meeting event. So first things first, this is an engineering sample, so things can change, but we do now have some specifications, of course, that have been locked in. First things first, it's 24 cores and 32 threads. So the hybrid architecture that we saw in Older Link is back, so the performance cores still have hyper-threading slash SMT, whatever you want to say, and the energy-efficient core count has now doubled, so rather than 8 cores for Older Lake, it's now 16 energy-efficient cores. You can see on the screen the slide, which has some pertinent details. I'll get into the double-digit performance boost in just a moment. We also have enhanced overclocking as well, um, with Intel now releasing the 12900KS, which has a clock frequency of up to 5.5 GHz. I think you can probably ascertain the direction that they're going with uh, Raptor Lake. But another small but not inconsequential detail is that these will be socket compatible with Older Lake motherboards. Now, I'm assuming that you're probably going to need to do a BIOS update, as is typical with these things, but this will give you a lot more confidence if you're considering jumping onto an Older Lake platform, and it almost certainly means that DDR4 is also going to be good to go. Naturally, DDR4 motherboards are pretty popular, especially for the B-series, like Honestly, there's not that much of a difference if you're pairing, just for example, a 12400 with a DDR4 versus DDR5. I actually recently took a look at an i5-12400 from Intel, and I have to say that the CPU is really good. I'm actually now doing some investigation for a 12900K, but a little bit different than, let's say, a review, but I won't talk about that too much in this video. You can check out our review, though, of the 12400 if you want. I will, of course, link it in the video description. We also have a demo which features both Blender and Adobe Premiere, and this was basically showing off the CPU core counts being used. Ultimately, these processors will launch in the second half, but let's get back to that double-digit performance boost. I've mentioned a couple of times uh, that my sources have been telling me that this is roughly what you're going to be seeing for Raptor Lake, and it's good to see that it's confirmed here, along with the aforementioned core count. I've personally been hearing around 10 to 15 percent at the highest end, although I do believe that that was inclusive of the clock frequency boosts over the 12900K as well. Again, with any performance boost, it's kind of like, well, what are we talking about? You know, what benchmarks and all that stuff. So it's not going to be incredible. Um, it's not, if you've got like a 12900K or a KS, you may not want to buy like a 13900K, although I say that again without having tested these things. Who knows, maybe they're a lot more energy efficient or something like that without actually seeing them. It's kind of difficult to know. But, of course, we do have those additional uh, cores as well. So maybe if you're doing like a lot of video editing or, you know, 3D rendering, that could be a reason. Although if you're purely gaming, probably not. Although it is great that Intel are releasing something that's possibly going to be decently competitive with Zen 4. I do believe Intel will probably not have the performance advantage, although, again, neither set of processors is released yet. Furthermore, in the same investor meeting, we also have Pat Gelsinger, who, for those who don't know, is the company's CEO, confirm various other products. Now, these are inclusive of Arrow Lake, which will succeed Meteor Lake, and we also have some other things as well. You can see them on screen yourself. Just for your FYI, I'm personally hearing that Meteor Lake as well as Arrow Lake are actually really good. Um, again, I do feel that Older Link and, you know, Raps Lake is essentially the same architecture. It's not a massive redesign, as most of you know. It's basically Intel's TikTok strategy. However... Meteor Lake and Arrow Lake are apparently really damn good. And I'm quite curious to see what is happening here because 
you know, with Zen 5 on the horizon, it's going to be really interesting, um, not just in terms of the raw performance, but things like power efficiency as well are going to be really big, particularly with what we've seen from companies like Apple and, of course, the uh, embracing of ARM and other things like that. However, it is another topic that I want to discuss in this video real quick, and it is Alchemist. Again, there is a benchmark that has emerged. I'm going to give credit to videocards.com for this discovery. I will, of course, link their article in the video description. Now, in this particular benchmark, the clock frequency of the top tier GPU, so this is 512 execution units, so assuming there's no misreporting or bugs going on, this is the top end SKU. It's running at 2400 megahertz, although that is the, quote, maximum frequency. It's worth noting that there could be some hinky stuff going on with the drivers, we'll get more into that in a moment, and the clock frequencies, but this was running on a fairly modest system. It was running on a 9600K, which is like six cores, six threads. However, uh, this was running on an OpenCL benchmark and Geekbench, so it's not particularly, you know, taxing on the old CPU anyway. I'm sure that people are going to ask in the comments, why the hell were they doing that? Well, there's several reasons that we're using such a system, and I'm actually just going to quickly tackle that in this video because I frequently get asked this question, actually. The first is that if they're just testing things like stability, um, basically sometimes things leak because it was like, oh crap, I did not remember to disable the Wi-Fi or unplug the Ethernet. Believe me, it can happen. And as for why they use this, probably because if they're just testing things like drivers um, or just stability or whatever, it's like, eh. We don't really care necessarily about the performance. We're just making sure that things work. Or they might be just testing things on older hardware or a plethora of other reasons. Like, ultimately, you know, a lot of the time, it's just like, have these driver changes cause things to go boom or whatever? You know, like, at, at the end of the day, sometimes they just try things because it's just available. Simple as that. Um, and maybe the more powerful, you know, benchmarking station was like, I don't know, an extra minute walk or something like that either way it doesn't particularly matter we have a result here of 85,448 now if you look at the nice graph that uh, videocards.com put together we can see that this is not that great on the surface in fact it's around let's say a little bit just a little bit slower than an RTX 2070 on average although I'm going to say that they're essentially identical now, remember that the benchmark performance of this card is supposed to be up to a 3070 in terms of gaming performance. However, recently, you know, I have mentioned that I've been hearing there are some major driver issues. And this possibly could be further demoed by um, someone on Twitter, Free. 26. I'll, of course, link their tweet as well in the video description, but I'm going to borrow their uh, graph here because it's quite telling, actually. You can see that they've actually done a really nice job of showing an average 3070 result versus DG2, and some benchmarks are really close. So, for example, if we pick on face detection, which is pretty much in the middle there, you can see that, you know, ultimately, the two results are really close to one one another. You can also make a pretty good argument as well for something like particle physics. Yeah, there is a small deficit there in the bar in the bars, but eh, it's pretty close, right? Same thing for SFT as well. But then things start to go a bit pear-shaped if we look at canny, because it's uncanny how much DG2 gets spanked. Ha ha ha. I'm so sorry. Um, but other things like Sobel as well, there's also quite a lot of difference. So there you go, guys. Ultimately, you know, DG2 at this point, the predominant thing that needs to be improved by Intel are the drivers. And they still have several months, basically, to work on these things because they're going to be released, of course, in Q2, at least according to Intel. And I suspect that, uh, you know, game performance is ultimately what most of us care about. It's going to be really interesting, I feel, to see how these perform. 
And I also want to just add one other small thing to this, and that is that Raja Kadori on Twitter has actually shown a rather interesting image. Ark Beast Canyon, Lara Croft XESS. I think the image pretty much, you know, speaks for itself here. It's quite interesting because obviously NVIDIA recently did a whole thing pushing DLSS now to various Tomb Raider games. Well, I suppose it wasn't just, you know, NVIDIA. Uh, you know, the developers themselves probably had something to do with that. But yeah, I'm going to be really interested to see what Intel's strategy of XESS is going forward. I have to be honest. I suspect that Intel are going to be ultra aggressive with XESS marketing. And I personally feel it could be really good for the industry on the methods that they're using to kind of encourage uptake in some ways, because ultimately it will also run on competitor hardware. I don't think that NVIDIA are just going to be like, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to let you guys, you know, have that upsampling win. I suspect that, you know, in the long term, there is a possibility, and I'm not saying this from a source perspective, just logical, that I do think eventually NVIDIA may have to open up DLSS to work on competitor hardware. And it will just be really interesting to see how all of this comes together, because ultimately... You know, just about everyone has upsampling technology at this point. Unreal Engine, AMD, NVIDIA, Sony, Microsoft, you name it, everyone has the damn thing. So, it's going to be really curious to see how all of that plays out. With this said, thank you very much for checking out the video. If you have enjoyed it, you know what to do. Leave a likey on the video, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.